Well, a warm welcome to today's talk. It's Friday the 27th of August. Now, I want to start off with the report from the United States that's coming up on the uh, the origins of this virus, the intelligence report we've been waiting for for 90 days. And let me just say it's a bit disappointing. But then we'll be looking at some relevant data from the States and we'll also be looking at some personal experience and we'll see how we got on after that. So let's just start off with this um, origins of the virus. Let's so no, say no more than that. Um, the two camps are it was a, a laboratory uh, escape somehow. No one really is seriously saying it was a bioengineered virus, but more a virus that was being worked on in a laboratory that could have escaped. The alternative is the zoonotic hypothesis where it would have gone from an animal to potentially straight to a human or from an animal such as a bat to a, uh, another animal to a human. The problem is we haven't discovered the animal yet. So, But let, let's come on to that now. Let's Let's look at where we are with this fascinating story actually the reason this is so important is really i couldn't really care less about the attribution of blame but we need to learn for future pandemics because there will be future pandemics and millions and tens of millions and, and i don't want to be melodramatic about this but a, a future pandemic could kill billions of people so this is just so important that we we understand as much as we possibly can so um 24th of August, three days ago, was actually the 90th day. And President Biden, you might remember, said, I want the report uh, in 90 days. And we believe it landed on his desk on the 25th, two days ago. But fortunately for, or unfortunately, there seems to be a bit of, bit of a leak. Again, how uh, deliberate or accidental these things are, I'll leave to your uh, your view. But anyway, the bottom line of the report, which of course is still private and has not been released yet, so we don't know this definitively, but we kind of do really. But it's not released. This is an unreleased report. It's inconclusive. So it looks remarkably disappointing, this report. So remember, President Biden um, tasked the intelligence agencies that uh, could bring us closer to a definitive conclusion about the origin of virus. That was the brief. And they've gone away and done that for 90 days. Now, this is encouraging. He also said this, you're going to have to increase your ranks with people with significant um, scientific uh, capacity relative to pathogens. Now, that's actually remarkably uh, reassuring that he said that because the intelligence services clearly need more scientists if we're going to avert a future pandemic. If we could synergize what the intelligence services are good at, whatever that is, <laughs> but we know they are we know they are good at collecting intelligence. If we could synthesize that with scientific and medical understanding, that would be a, a great leap forward and, and could, as we've said, potentially save many, many lives in the future. So I'm pleased to see that's happening. We assume that the intelligence services have been recruiting scientists quite frantically lately. Uh, but the bottom line seems to be on this report. Intelligence officers fell short of a consensus, which is a nice way of saying uh, we don't know mate right so may the agencies uh, coalesced around two likely scenarios as we've said the natural zoonotic transmission or the lab leak so they're the two main hypotheses the engineered virus one is not really running at the moment so that they're the two consensus that they're the two camps uh, now um, we believe that two agencies two of the intelligence agencies th th these are direct quotes from the washington post Two of the intelligence agencies lean towards the hypothesis that the virus emerged from human contact with an infected animal. So two intelligence agencies thought that. A third intelligence agency, and we don't know which is which yet, whether this is CIA, FBI or, or, or something I've never heard of, but whatever it is. But a third one leaned towards the lab accident scenario. So the intelligence community in the States is divided on this, which is pretty interesting. It is divided on it. Uh, dozens of analysts and intelligence officials, dozens, we don't know how many, is it 100, is it 200, we don't know. Multiple agencies, and that is the conclusion. So we'll give you, uh, the intelligence services are giving us a definite maybe on that. Now, this is not really the intelligence services' fault because they had so little data to go on. I'm sure they made a superb job. In fact, we've got good evidence that they did make a quite a superb job of analysing the data that they had, but there's simply not enough data. Calculate the distance to the moon given no information at all. Well, obviously you can't do it. You need to be given information to work on. Um, following on from this, um, 
Dr. Realman, Stanford University microbiologist, we should not even be thinking about closing the book or backing off, but rather ratcheting up the effort. So this is going to go on. We do need to get answers on this. Unfortunately, the Wuhan lab has not released its lab records. Now, this is remarkably unfortunate that the Wuhan Institute of Virology has not released its full records. Now, why on earth wouldn't it release its full records? I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions on that. But it hasn't. And we can also assume that the Chinese um, scientists have been working fairly hard over the past, what, 18 months now to look for the animal reservoir. In fact, we know they've been looking for the animal reservoir and the animal, um, the animal vector of this disease. And so far, nothing has come up. So, um, OK, things might come up in the future. We, we, we don't know. But if the lab were to release its records, it would certainly reduce some of my paranoia instantly. But so far, it hasn't. Um, and we don't know really why it hasn't. Now, remember this report from the World Health Organization, basically now discredited. Lab leak, extremely unlikely, was their, was their quote. But then, of course, the leader of that uh, expedition actually... Um, you know, I can't, I can't, don't want that yet. I can't even remember the term. He's something like, wasn't rescinded or redacted, but basically excused himself from the committee or was excused from the committee or something. So it was all completely unsatisfactory. And, and, and even Dr. Tedros said at the time, we need more than this. But 90 days work, we can assume hard work from the American intelligence services, and they simply don't have enough data, which is a real pity. But as I say, we do need this. Millions or billions of lives could depend on this for future pandemics and, and other diseases that are happening all the time, viral diseases. It, it really is something that we want to know about. Now, do you think we'll ever know? Put your hand up if you think we're going to find out a definitive conclusion on this. Well, yeah, I'm not too many hands up. Most of you are like me. I think you're a bit pessimistic. Now, moving on to the United States, what we do know, <laughs> we have got accurate data for these are the, uh, this is the, what's this? Um, these are the trends in the number of COVID-19 cases in the United States. So this is daily cases. And unfortunately, we do see quite a significant increase in cases still. Not as high as last winter's peak, but the cases are still going up. And if we look at the deaths in the United States, daily deaths, sadly, we do see quite a marked increase actually recently above the average well, over a thousand uh, deaths there, new deaths, 1,183 on that day, um, seven day rolling average. Uh, the seven day rolling average is actually uh, over 1,200. So we are seeing quite significant increases in the past few days, which is unfortunate. But of course, it's not surprising because the cases have increased and there's a lot of unvaccinated, still about 90 million unvaccinated people in the States. Moving on to more data from the States, this one is um, trends in the number of COVID-19 vaccina vaccinations in the US. And we do see that's going up, which is good. And if we look at some of the and all, all of these data, you can look at individual states. It's pretty good. So let's just look at one Florida where there was vaccine hesitancy to some extent. And we see the vaccine rate there is picking up, which is is good. Um, the um, people are realising just how important it is now to get vaccinated and the rates are picking up so that is encouraging but of course we have this delay and that delay is manifest and the lack of vaccine is manifest in this slide here the increase in hospitalizations which is quite significant now this is the united states as a whole and this was the peak last winter and really the numbers are going up quite dramatically now towards that peak could we hit those kind of numbers again? Um, yes, potentially we could. Um, let's hope not, but we certainly could. So that's all live data from the States. Um, just a couple of... Uh, now, now the point is about hospitalizations in the States. They, they, it's not equally distributed as we look. The, there's a lot of the southern states, particularly which were under vaccinated, that have got much higher levels. This is not equally spread. And hospital pressure is uh, quite significant in some of those areas. Um, just before we get to the hospitalisation situation, though, there are all those links. Always clip them for yourself. 
South Dakota, the, the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally. Now, we, we this is exactly what we predicted. Now, two weeks ago, it finished half a million visitors. And, of course, we said this is guaranteed spread. And the people will take it from Sturgis all around the country. Now, we're not sure about what's happening all around the country yet because hopefully most parts of the country where these motorcyclists are going to have high vaccination uptakes. Nothing against motorcyclists. I'm a motorcyclist myself. It's just, it's just, it's just the amount of people in one place that was the problem. So basically five times more infections than there were two weeks ago. Massive increase. This is for South Dakota as a whole. Positivity rate in South Dakota is 16.7%, pretty high. Meade County, where Sturgis is, positivity rate, the number of tests coming back positive, 36.1%. Really quite huge in South Dakota, particularly around the Sturgis area. Quite inevitable. This is exactly what you and me predicted here three weeks ago. It's exactly what's happening. We knew it was going to happen because it happened last year. Um, motorcyclists going back to people that aren't potentially vaccinated you don't need me to tell you about the risk there um, florida for example we've looked at hospitalization pressures in mississippi and missouri but ho 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 florida for example hospitalizations tripled in the past month 90 uh, percent of the hospitalizations are unvaccinated um, now ye yesterday we, we we noticed that um it was um los angeles county we were looking at yesterday um, people that were vaccinated were 19 times less likely to be hospitalised. So people in Los Angeles County who were not vaccinated were 19 times more likely to be hospitalised. Not 19%, 19 times more. Here we see that, so that gives us about 95%, whereas here it's about 90%. But it's in the same area. The majority are not uh, vaccinated. Now, I think I'll leave that there now because I've got a, a very interesting report from Julia, who is a senior healthcare professional herself. And I won't say too much. We'll, we'll, let, her tell, we'll let Julia tell her own story. And it, it's, it's, I just find it really so, um, well, it's really noble of people to, uh, to share this material with us. And, and you, you'll see what I mean as, as you watch the video. So, Julia, thank you very much. And over to you, Doctor. Hi, Dr. Campbell. My name is Dr. Julia Champalia. I'm a pharmacist who's been practicing in the Chicagoland area since 2004. And before I get into some of the points that I wanted to make, I really wanted to say thank you for your daily summaries. Um, not only are they fact-based, they're referenced, um, they're concise, and the layman or the healthcare professional can easily understand and make decisions that are best um, for them and their families. I know because that's what I use them for. And I thank you so much. Um, you're quite a beacon in this darkness. So thank you. Um, but I, I think I had found your channel in uh, fall of 2020 and uh, we were just about to lock down um, my family and I. I have two daughters who are teenagers. One missed her complete year of 10th grade. The other who was uh, graduating from high school, a uh, senior, she got uh, fully vaccinated and was able to go back the last few weeks um, prior to graduation. Um, but I was diagnosed with lupus in 2018. Uh, and it's really been a struggle. I I don't think I've ever fully appreciated. You, you, you try to appreciate and understand every patient's experience. Um, I don't think I could understand a, a chronic condition like that. And I guess that's, um, you know, kind of the curse of a, a chronic condition is, is that you really, you know, there's no cure you have to keep treating it you have to change your lifestyle you have to uh try new regimens regimens that were working fail so it's it's been difficult but one of the things that i noticed um very early on they had um a 60 minutes um with regarding um long COVID. And I was 
even from the very beginning of this pandemic, all of the symptoms that were being discussed sounded so much like some of the issues that, um, symptoms that I, I suffer from, um, from lupus. Um, they talk about COVID toes. I have like lupus toes <laughs> and you can't always get that feel that circulation. Um, they, uh, you know, all the achiness, the brain fog, and I will probably say, uh, uh, and forget what I'm about to say during this thing. It's legitimate and it's very scary and troubling and um, just kind of lose that spot in your sentence and wonder what, what word is kind of coming next and grasping for it. It's, it's troubling. Um, and then there's just the fatigue uh, along with the pain. So prior to 2018, at one point I was working for different jobs. I was working in um, a pharmacy in a grocery store or supermarket. I was a professor um, for a pharmacology class for nurses. And um, I was also doing some medication uh, therapy management consulting for two different firms. So it's really constantly going um, and then I, I've since changed into a different uh, position. Um, I don't see patients, but uh, I deal more with uh, quality issues um, for a large um, government agency. And um, I can't tell you how many sick days I've had since I've been diagnosed. And it really scares me. Um, the first few times it happened, um, and I just, I couldn't get out of bed. And there were some stressful things going on in my life, but I could always find the motivation, you know, reach down and grab it and, and go. And I just, it wasn't happening. So I have really begged people from the time that I really um, saw that long COVID episode not to get this because while there's some people out there who will say, oh, you know, 99.9% .9 survival rate, you don't know what this disease can do to you long term. And that's even without being hospitalized. I will say that um, I really couldn't go anywhere. So I've taken to doing a lot of research. Um, a lot of reading, a lot of listening um, about contagion, um, about viruses. And it's something I, I was told in pharmacy school, um, you know, every professor kind of gets up there and touts their little thing. You know, if it's a cardiologist, they're going to say he, the heart is the most important organ in the body and it's it's an op, uh, ophthalmologist they're gonna say the eye is the most important <laughs> um you know all again all very important of course but everyone's kind of you know they're kind of going to bat for for their own specialty well the infectious disease doctor um got up to the podium one day and said one day we hope to prove that all disease is rooted and contagion. And I was kind of like, okay, that's a stretch. Like, really, come on. Um, and then sometime after that, it was discovered that H. pylori was responsible for ulcers. And later on, um, we learned that HPV is, is can cause cancer. Um, you know, we see things like shingles after childhood chicken pox. Um, herpes simplex is something that doesn't go away and stays rooted in the body. So from all this, and, and probably more that I'm forgetting right now, obviously polio, um, 
it, it, you know, is debilitating and, and can cause paralysis throughout life. Um, but I, I really didn't think much of it in the past, but I had been diagnosed in 2009 with H1N1 and I was 32. I was healthy. Uh, no, I just gave away my age. I had uh, normal BMI, um, very active. Uh, two little girls, um, worked, was a Girl Scout leader, <laughs> um, you name it. Um, and, uh, so I really didn't think much of it. And, um, that's why I kind of was, uh, at the very beginning of this, I, I didn't worry as much as I probably should have, obviously, um, because in 2009, I, I worked all week sick. Um, but you know, you're always, I was always sick and the, our pharmacy had no, um, uh, temperature or had no heating, um, in December. So we, um, you know, I, you worked sick and you have to, you know, gut it out. And so on my day off on a weekend, I went into the ER and they isolated me, which is so weird at the time and put a mask on me and then came back. They had obviously taken a test. I, I can't even recall when that actually happened, but they're like, oh, you have H1N1. And I remember the doctor wrote Tamiflu for me and then also wrote for Vicodin ES and, you know, it, it, opioids were given out very freely, but I was kind of thinking at the time, well, is this, you know, for the cough? And my thought is, is that there was a lot of, um, a pain, um, associated with it when I think back, um, about it now because I was thinking, oh, like any good American, <laughs> here's my Tamiflu. I'm going to take this and I'm going to get to be okay for Christmas and everything will be okay. And, um, I took the Tamiflu and after five days of therapy, I felt awful. So I went to see my primary care physician and I was actually dumb enough to ask for speed. Um, I'm not going to lie. I asked for it because I still needed to do Christmas shopping for two little girls. And he's like, absolutely not. You need to go back to your bed. And here's a note. You cannot go back to work until after New Year's. And this is even before Christmas. It's like, and you need to rest. And it was something I, I've always preached to my patients after because we really do. And every patient wants that cure and wants that I need to get back to life. And I, I would always say that was the, some of the best advice I ever got is you need to rest. But the point of my story is, is that, and I, I didn't think about this much at the time, um, because I, I thought there might be other factors involved, either I, I environmental or, um, other issues that, that might have brought about this, uh, what I'm about to tell you about. Um, now, my now ex-husband, um, who I was married to at the time, in 2012, 2013, he was diagnosed with lupus. And so what I've kind of been telling people all along is, is that I'm not sure that that H1N1 was the cause, but I know that if, if, if it was, I would have done anything I could to avoid that because I, I still feel guilty in some ways for the times that I was very, um, come on, get up, get moving, gotta go, you gotta help me take care of the kids. Because I, I wasn't, I don't know if I just had that, I was overlooking things and I, I did have some pain issues at the time, but I really, I, I, kind of denial works for me. I know it's bad to say, but um, 
you know, you, you just have to wonder and, um, and have to sort of think, you know, was this something that affected my life so much? Because I know that in the past years of being diagnosed with this, I'm not the same person that I was. Um, yeah. And, uh, there's one more thing I wanted to add to that too, before I, um, let you go on that is that um, my great grandmother, who is an immigrant from Poland, um, she lived very long. I believe she lived till night. She was ninety three years old, but she always had Parkinson's. You know, and it was when you're little and you see that sh that shaking. It's it's odd, you know. Um, like why can't you stop? <laughs> um, and. I didn't find out until this year that one of the long-term effects of the 1918 flu, um, something they found was an increase in incidence in Parkinson's disease um, in patients who survived that. And I asked my mom if my great-grandmother had um, the the 1918 flu and she she couldn't recall but i do remember seeing her uh, you know american naturalization papers and it was that squiggly writing and she would have been in her either late 30s early 40s um by the time that she was naturalized so that's a bad disease to live with for you know 50 years um and uh i just I, I beg people, you know, not to think that you'll, this is nothing, it's not that big of a deal, not to look from your own experience, look at the numbers, listen to what people tell you, listen to your doctors, and, and do what you can. Um, we're at a precipice here in this country where our children are at, at risk, and that troubles me so deeply. Um, that as adults, when we had the opportunity to stop this, um, we didn't, we acted like children and I, I'm extremely disheartened by that. And I hope that people could look past all their issues. And, um, I have some thoughts on that. I might get back to another time because I've already gone way over here, but, um, just some information that I, I've been wanting to kind of share. And um, I am going to go get my booster dose, booster dose, because I'm immunocompromised. Um, yeah, this Friday. So wasn't a great experience <laughs> last time I went into a full flare. But thank you again for everything. Keep up the good work. You're doing great. Um, uh, you're helping so many people in this country and around the world and thank you so much there are very few um significant people who shine there's the ones we we can't see beside behind all the ppe and those hospitals that are just I, I, my heart breaks for them i i really i can't understand it but i i really appreciate what you're doing here Thank you so much for that, Julia. Um, wow. Um, so lupus, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus. L l l lupus comes from the Latin for wolf. And the wolf sort of roams around from village to village and forest to forest. And lupus is the same. It can affect different parts of the body. So it can cause, it's an autoimmune disease. It can cause inflammation in the brain, the heart, the kidneys, and it can kind of move around and it's a chronic autoimmune disease, lupus. So that brain fog you talked about, Julia, I've had that. It is horrible. You just you just feel like you're watching yourself on a video, like you're not there. It's terrible. I had it when I was really stressed, I think, once. It was just horrible. The tiredness, of course, but we're not talking about, oh, I'm a bit tired or go to bed. This is a pathological tiredness. The H1N1 2009, I remember being involved in the vaccination campaign associated with that. And, you know, you, 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 you're like a lot of us, Julia, you're a tough cookie. So you carry on working when you're sick. And, you know, m maybe like me, you, you've been there. I, I have been in a situation where I should have been at home in bed and I've been at work. And 
you're not doing yourself any favours, you're not doing those you're working with any favours, you can make mistakes, you're bad tempered. Um, we have to acknowledge the limitations of our humanity and when we need time off sick we just have to take it because humans are not capable of working through any significant illness. Um, all of us have looked for symptomatic treatment, so you look for amphetamines, you're a pharmacist, you know much better than that. But at the time, you just feel so desperate, you need something to get you going, and of course, it's wrong. It's a symptomatic treatment. Even taking a acetaminophen or paracetamol when you're ill, certainly for adults, um, you know, when you're ill, you're supposed to feel ill, you're supposed to be in bed, but you take acetaminophen or paracetamol and you feel a bit better because it artificially reduces the fever. And you go around and start doing things you shouldn't be doing. And of course, the fever is that the fever, the high fever increases the body's um, resistance to infection anyway. So um, two, two reasons really to be very careful before taking acetaminophen or, acetaminophen or paracetamol or ibuprofen to bring temperatures down. You're supposed to be ill. You're supposed to be resting. Um, I remember when I was a student, when I was about 18, 19, I went to some Parkinson's lectures by some old doctors. Uh, this this is in 1970. <coughs> Uh, no, and seriously, it was 1976 I had these lectures. Um, um, now, in 1976, so the old doctors there had treated post-encephalitic Parkinson's disease, and it was caused by the H1N1 from the 1918-19 pandemic. There used to be a lot of it around, thankfully not now. Similarities between SLE and long COVID. Yes, you can't ignore those, can you? Uh, you're right, the Helicobacter pylori causes peptic ulceration. That's a bacteria. Human papillomavirus causes cervical cancer. And of course, shingles is caused by herpes zoster. So yeah, well, so I, w I certainly wouldn't go with the idea that all diseases are infectious, but quite a lot of them are. And of course, when you are ill, you've got to go with it and give the body's immune system time to work. Don't be like me and Julia, who'll just tough it out and work through it, give your body time to recover. And the thing is, Julia probably won't know for sure now whether the lupus she's suffering from now would have been less severe or not present if she'd rested properly during that acute illness. Julia, I suspect not. I suspect you would have still developed lupus anyway for immunological reasons, but I agree it's uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's a doubt in the mind that nags away at you and um, it's uh, it, it, that, that sort of nagging un unanswered question doesn't go away. But I, I suspect that even if you had rested, you may have still got it because it's an autoimmune uh, immunological disease, which isn't particularly well understood, really. So um, I, it's just so noble of people to uh, to to uh, give us the benefit of these experiences. And, and we really appreciate it. Um, so I've gone on a bit long about it now as well, because there's just so many lessons to learn from that. And let's let's hope that people benefit from benefit from that and of course the next part we would love we'd love to hear from you julia so thank you very much and uh, thank you for watching